We are very happy to have invited for this evening um, Professor Stephanie Baumann. She's uh, currently at the uh, University of Lisbon. Um, she is working there in a project, a group called the Philosophy, the Institute for the Philosophy of Language. Um, Professor Bauman received her PhD from the University of Paris 8 uh, about five or so years ago. Um, and her dissertation was actually on the subject of this evening's lecture, which is the artist Walid Rod's Atlas Project. So would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Stephanie Bauman. Very happy to be here. And as uh, Tom just said, I'm not an artist, I'm just a scholar, <laughs> but I still present uh, a project that has been done by an artist. And uh, maybe some of you know actually the project because it has been exhibited in MoMA, I think two years ago. So uh, the project is called the Atlas Group Project, even if actually the group has only one member who is actually the artist himself. So Walidra, there is no group, even if uh, sometimes people think there is a group behind it. Uh, and Walid Rad is a New York-based Lebanese artist. So he lives in New York, uh, but he is Lebanese, and his whole project is about Lebanon. So the Atlas Group presents itself uh, in the internet like this. Here you see it, I'll read it to you actually. It says, the Atlas Group is a project established in 1999 to research and document the contemporary history of Lebanon. One of our aims with this project is to locate, preserve, study and produce audio, visual, literary and other artifacts that shed light on the contemporary history of Lebanon. In this endeavor, we produced and found several documents including notebooks, films, videotapes, photographs and other objects. Moreover, we organized these works in an archive, the Atlas Group Archive. So if we did not know that we were confronted with an artwork here, maybe if we only looked at this website, um, this small introductive text would at first time seem to simply describe um, a research project uh, about a, the comp uh, sorry, contemporary history of a country which is Lebanon and that is organized in an archive. And if we look at the presentation here on the website, or if we listen to a public presentation of the project uh, that Walid Raad does sometimes, or if we even look at an exhibition of the project, man, we would see that many elements point actually to this institutional character. Um, adopting this established format of an archive, which is an institution that everybody knows and everybody associates things with, um, associates um, this whole project uh, with specific standards and validity and grants it a certain kind of an aura of seriousness, of um, legitimacy, all these things. But quickly, and already if you still don't know that it's an artwork, you would realize that something is strange, even in this small presentation. Something is really unusual about what he says here. Because the very structure of the Atlas Group explicitly not only collects and organizes documents, but also studies and produces them. And this is something that normal archives would never do, as you all know. Normally, you go to an archive in order to find documents that have been, that are actually real traces from the past, that have been authenticated, and that guarantee you an access to documents that come from a certain place or a certain time. And moreover, if we look even more closely, we can remark that the very structure of the archive itself is not stable, even if it appears to be quite conventional. So the records are divided, here you see it, in three different types. This is still actually the form that you can find in a normal archive, that you have like a classification of the documents and the files. And here you have this uh, classification. The records are divided into these three different types. 
each of which is further subdivided according to the provenance of the documents. So you have here three different types. And if you look at them, you see immediately that this also is quite strange because you have the first category is A, which means authored. Uh, for those records to which an author is attributed, FD, found documents, uh, is for those that are described as anonymous, and AGP, Atlas Group Productions, are those documents that are explicitly produced by the Atlas Group. However, it is also said that actually the artist produced all the documents himself. So we are confronted with two dissimilar layers on the same site, one of which subsuming all the documents under a generalized fiction, saying that uh, you have those three different categories, the other differentiating the nature of the documents of, uh, according to the alleged origin. So you have at the same time everything is done by the artist, but um, some are authored, some are found, some are produced. So this doesn't work together. Furthermore, the files sometimes change their position inside this classification. So some of the documents appear in type A just to appear later on in type FD. Or the same documents sometimes appear under different names while keeping the same description. So you have a different author attributed <coughs> to the documents. All these operations have the purpose to nullify the logic of an archive, of categorizing. Because everything loses its identity. What is an identity if you can either name it like this or like that? So this doesn't really work, even if all the form actually points to this logic. What seems at every particular manifestation as a stable institution proves to be adapted according to the context, the public, and the actual events. That is, Walid Rad explains, in different places and at different times, I have called the Atlas Group an imaginary foundation, a foundation I established in 1976, and a foundation established in 1976 by Mahat Rabulsi. In Lebanon in 1999, I stated the Atlas Group is a non-profit foundation established in Beirut in 1967. In New York in 2000 and in Beirut in 2002, I stated the Atlas Group is an imaginary foundation that I established in 1999. I say different things at different times and in different places according to the personal, historical, cultural and political considerations with regard to the geographical location and my personal and professional relation with the audience and how much they know about the political, economic and cultural histories of Lebanon, the wars in Lebanon, the Middle East and contemporary art." Quote end. So it seems that not only this archive that seems to be something very classical is not as classical as it seems, we are also already part of the presentation or the artwork without even knowing it because the artist considers our position um, in his presentation. We are all, always considered as a certain public with a certain background and certain expectations and the Atlas Group is always reformulated according to those attempts. So we are very far from a stable structure. We are very far from a classical archive. Maybe that this gesture actually of placing something, of saying this is an archive in a context and in an art context might remind you on the gesture of Marcel Duchamp. Because of course, Marcel Duchamp, what he did, you all know that, he placed the urinal in a gallery, and urinal being uh, a, an object to use and not an artwork, saying this is an artwork because I am the artist and I say this is an artwork. Why did he do that? Of course, because he wanted to problematize certain things, certain um, things that seem to be obvious. For example, he wanted to, to problematize that um, something can become an artwork if the artist says it is an artwork and if the public accepts that. So um, 
or also, of course, the temporality of the receptive moment. When do you see it? Where do you see it? Do you accept it as an artwork? So all these things um, were important for Marcel Duchamp. For Walidrad, actually now, we are confronted with a similar tactique. What he's doing is, he's of course, it's different, but still he's also saying this is an archive. If you accept it to be an archive, you have to think with me how an archive works. You have to think with me, or you have also to question yourself, what do you suppose an archive to be? So maybe it's also to, to question all the context itself, just as also Marcel Duchamp wanted it. So this is, I think, a, a project that is imminently critical because of this, not only because of this gesture, but this gesture is a very strong point. So rather than innocently playing with a serious institution, and there are a lot of artworks working with the archival form, or doing archives, or collecting things and saying this is an archive. I think Walidrat does something a bit different. He actually wants to question not only actually the archives as an institution, also other institutions, or other ways of standardizing knowledge um, by uh, pointing to the political implications. And we will see how this works. So you can already sense, actually, that there is something political going on if you look at the double location of the Atlas group. Because Walid Raad says this archive actually is located in two different sites. First, New York, which you all know very well, <laughs> and Beirut. These are two cities that are, of course, very different, not only because they are far away, but also because the very um, gesture of placing an archive takes on a completely different meaning in each. So I'm sure you all know that uh, if you talk here about an archive in the US or also in Europe, you, you have the same situation or more or less the same situation. Here, if you talk here about an archive, you uh, acknowledge that there are certain standards for research and archives that are commonly accepted. So normally, if you go to an archive, you have certain ideas what you can find there. You can trust that the sources have been legitimated, and you can trust also that it, this archive will be as neutral as possible, not an ideological propaganda instrument. You can trust that what you find there is an adequate basis for scientific knowledge production. This is normally what you associate with an archive if you are in a state like the US. Normally, you don't question uh, the political implications of the ar archive you're visiting. Yet in Lebanon, you are in a completely different situation. I don't know how well you know Lebanon. Maybe you know that uh, from the news, then normally you see that it's a very chaotic place with a lot of uh, wars going on, a lot of conflicts. It's like in the middle of the Middle East. Maybe you know that there has been a war going on from 75 to 90, and actually there are still small wars <laughs> going on all the time. So it's still a situation where complex political conflicts uh, are happening. It's also a place where you have a very heterogeneous society. So it's not like, a, like in the US or in most states also in Europe where you have like a, the state is, is um, a specific power. You have um, uh, normally um, one religion that is much stronger than the others. Um, um, and normally the state and the religion are not as connected. In Lebanon, you have 18 state recognized communities, which are all religious communities, 18. So it's not Christian and Muslim, it's uh, several Christian ones. You have Maronites, you have Orthodox, you have uh, Protestants. And it's not Muslim only, but it's Sunni, it's Shia, it's Druze, it's, I don't even, I cannot even say all the 18, but they have 18 different. And actually all, uh, all politics is divided according to these different uh, communities. So really you have to imagine it's a very different situation. This also makes that, um, I am, and during the civil wars, it was not only the communities fighting one against the other, by constantly changing the alliances between, so there was a time when the Sunni were against, 
I don't know what, uh, Shia, and then there was a time when Syrians were with the Christians, and after that they were with it. It was always constantly changing. Um, you also had, during the wars and until today, many different uh, nations that actually contributed to the war there. So it was not only Lebanese fighting Lebanese, you had Israelis fighting Palestinians, you had Iranians fighting Americans, you have all kinds of very different countries that were really implicated in the war, actively in, implicated in the war. Uh, furthermore, um, the past and present active or passive involvement of different foreign states and political powers has always been very strong. And this since actually um, the independence, even before the independence of the Lebanese state. Before Lebanon became independent, it has been under French mandate from 1920 to 43, which is the, the date of the independence of Lebanon, so it's also a very young country. Um, which makes also that you have many different languages spoken in everyday life, for example. So, so most of Lebanese people that you could meet can speak perfect English, perfect French, perfect Arabic. So it's all these three languages actually are speaking in an everyday life. So it's not only somebody who's fluent in another language, it's also really spoken. Uh, which makes also that these people have many different references. So I'm, I'm sure Normally, uh, American people have a set of references. If you go to France, normally this will be slightly different. If you go to Saudi Arabia, this will be very different. If you go to Lebanon, you have like a mixture <laughs> of these references. For example, what is a, a great philosopher? Here you would say, I don't know, Pierce, if I watched your... <laughs> uh, or you would say Adorno, so Germans would <laughs> agree. <laughs> Uh, I think in France they would say Deleuze or they would say uh, Descartes. Um, if you go now in, in Arabic countries, this of course would be very different. In Lebanon it depends where you are studying, who you consider as an important philosopher. So all these things are there in everyday life. That's really important to understand that it's a coexistence. So this maybe makes it understandable that in such a country where you have a real heterogeneity, a lived heterogeneity in everyday life, First, you don't have an official history. So uh, students, for example, in school, or, or pupils in school, actually uh, do not uh, do learn history until 43. And 43 is the, actually uh, the date of the independence of Lebanon. So there is as if there was no history in Lebanon. <laughs> um, why do they not have a history? Because, of course, there are certain versions, many different versions of the history, but none is official. So there is not something that you have in, in countries like in, in, in the US, like a consensus. You have one history, then you can have alternative histories or, or people uh, uh, contesting that official history, but you have one. In Lebanon, you don't. Um, yeah. After the war in Lebanon, after, in 91, there was an amnesty law also that has been promulgated shortly after the end and which uh, blocked every effort to rigorously investigate the events and precluded also any attempt to legally pursue the actors responsible for the war. So until today you have many different people uh, that were <coughs> former warlords, everybody knows that, and who are, have still very important <coughs> positions, political positions, economic, cultural, all kinds of positions. So maybe now it becomes more understandable why in Lebanon, speaking of an archive, which means a monopolistic structure uh, based on a consensus <laughs> of what this history could be, this is a very complicated thing. It's already something that, that is very problematic and very far from being obvious. Why? Also because everybody who says this would be like the platform on which we erase an archive, this can become very easily uh, ideological. So if you say this is our basis, for example, uh, all this started with the war of uh, uh, Palestinians against Israelis, then you immediately have somebody else who says, no, this is only your, your biased version of it. We have to look at it differently. So you don't have a national, you have a national archive actually in Lebanon, but it doesn't work. And it has never really worked. And this is the point of departure of Walid Raad's 
project. So now we come back to the Atlas group. On the one hand, he reacts to an ongoing conflictual uh, political situation, to the absence of historical clarification and a highly aggressive uh, social climate. But on the other hand, he also reflects uh, different ways of considering uh, such a country from the outside. For example, the US, like as he places his archive in New York, with that idea of in, that we have uh, certain concepts which could grasp this um, reality by uh, finally by, by identifying certain things. So instead of upholding the model of an allegedly impartial institution based on supposedly neutral categories, which could be an archive, for example, here, the Atlas Group confronts it with the politically overloaded reality of a particular country in the aftermath of a civil war. It's like, it's as if um, the antagonistic reality of post-war Lebanon uh, subtly burst it into the monopolistic institution and perverts it from the inside, thereby challenging its impartial pretension and uncovering its political implications. So finally, what, what happens with this archive, it's not, actually it's not only we want to find out something about the history of a country, it's also we want to, to critically question how we try to find out these things. So it's as if Walid Raad would turn the lights on you. <laughs> you as somebody who tries to find out certain things with certain um, things in your head already. This is what is questioned here. So we are facing an amalgam, actually, of different things. A stable archival structure and that which undermines the rational identity thinking on which it is based. An important aspect here is also that the Atlas group does not conceal that it's really different from a normal archive. As you saw before, Walid Rad is super explicit. He says that he invents all these people, <laughs> that they do not actually exist. He says that. Um, he also says um, that the documents are actually produced by himself, that they are invented, and that they are artifacts specifically produced uh, by the Atlas Group for the purpose of the project on the basis of factual events on the one side, so it's not completely fiction, but on the other hand also on the basis of events that could have happened. So this is a bit the situation that we have. So you see it's quite a complex project. Um, I would like to show you actually some of the uh, documents. Then you will see that this logic of, of really you have these two sides, two different sides. You have also this idea that the form can criticize the content that a content is never alone and it's never only a narrative. It's always also the way how a narrative is embedded in a, in a context that is really meaningful for the Atlas group. And so I'm going to show you um, some of the documents and you will see uh, how this translates into the images also and how he work, works with the images. So to start with, I would like to introduce the character which is maybe the most um, emblematic one of the Atlas group. And uh, actually, I think this is maybe the document that is most known of all. It's attributed to a certain Dr. Fadel Fachori. In one of the files, you have these photographs. Actually, it's an invented character. It does not exist. But here you see already how Walid Rad works. He still gives you a photograph. So it's difficult not to believe that this character exists, even if he tells you he does not exist, but he shows uh, he shows you the character. So that's part of his strategy, actually, to see that you believe, when you have an image, you believe more quickly. So the Dr. Fadel Fachuri is actually um, introduced as the most renowned historian of his time. And here you see first that he seems to be important, as he's the most renowned historian of his time. But at the same time, it's a bit, if you speak about the most renowned historian, it's a bit as if you would speak about the prettiest princess or the strongest hero. So it's, you see that it's part of a fairy tale also. This is not so serious. Mm. The notebook that I would like to show you 
is called uh, Missing Lebanese Wars. And it's actually, this is presented as the front page, and this is the back page. So he says it's a block, a notebook, and this is introduced, actually it's written here in French. This is actually the text. Here you already see that we are inside a, this is meant to be like a notebook of a historian, but if you look at this, it's not really uh, scientific how it's made up. So, what is written here, and what is also kind of the description of this uh, document, is the following. He says, it is little known that the major historians of the Lebanese wars were avid gamblers. It is said that they met every Sunday at the racetrack, Marxist, actually in the French he says Maronites, um, and Islamists bet on races 1 to 7, Maronite nationalists and socialists on races 8 through 15. Race after race, the historian stood behind the track photographer whose job was to imagine the winning horse as it crossed the finish line to record the photo finish. It is also said that they convinced, some say bribed, the photographer to snap only one picture as the winning horse arrived. Each historian vegged on precisely when, how many fractions of a second before or after the horse crossed the finish line, the photographer would expose his frame. So this now um, becomes really strange <laughs> because we are told that we are in front of a notebook of a historian and then we are with such a story actually. What is striking at the first place is maybe that the most renowned historian is not at all presenting like something like results of his research or even documents with which he works, but he's telling the story of one of his regular leisure activities during his free time, along with other representatives of his profession in the midst of the civil war. It's already very strange to imagine that you're in the situation of a civil war and what are you doing? You go to a hippodrome and you bet on a horse. Uh, you don't even bet on a horse, you bet on very complicated things, as I just said. So instead of elucidating the past, those historians gamble one against each other. And this, by the way, this is a, a small hint to what I just said, that actually historians, there is no official history, so there is really kind of a competition who has the more official history of the histories that exist. But here, the historians not only turn a blind eye to the historical political situation, but also to the horse race as such, as they are only interested in the gap between the actual event on the horse's arrival on the finish line and its photographic proof to be discovered the next day in the newspaper, which raises a bit the question why they should even be present at the Hippodrome, because that doesn't help anything for, for, their, for, their, um, for their game. Visually, you have this uh, here, sorry. Actually, you have several of these pages. In an exhibition, normally you have, you have them printed like this. This is also something important, there's no original. <laughs> it's also something that you won't find in any archive, that you only have printed pages like this. I show you some of them. And here you see, actually it's always the same structure. You always have a, a cutout photograph of the newspaper on every page. Then you have texts written here in English and here in Arabic. Here you already see, um, yeah, this, what, what I said, it's, it's quite typical for Lebanon that you have several languages, but at the same time it also introduces like a, several directions as Arabic you read uh, from right to left and English from, um, from left to right. And you have all these calculations. It seems to be quite complicated what he's doing, but finally it's only a game. Then you have these actually, those English uh, comments, are actually comments on the winning historian, and they're quite pejorative if you read them. So maybe, yeah, it's, it's a really, you don't really know what kind of knowledge you could, could get out of this. And then you come to see that it's actually quite strange, but it seems that Dr. Fahouri is only interested in the sphere of rumors. Because it's, uh, if you remember what I just read to you, it's always, it is said, some say, 
So we are not at all in front of cold facts. We are in front of hearsays. So, yeah, we are immersed in an atmosphere where hearsay and suspicion and rumors make their way into factual reality, which also, by the way, uh, in Lebanon is quite important because there was very, uh, because of the situation, there was, was very little, there was, was for example, no uh, official television station or radio station. It was all uh, made by militia or by, by, by private people. So there was nothing that could be granted for official. This is the situation in which you are at that time in Lebanon. Another thing that is really strange, if you look at uh, this whole notebook, is if you remember um, how he divides the historians. Because normally historians should um, share, first and foremost, the same professional ethos of impartiality. Here, actually, they are only identified through their community. But is it really the community? And that's the question. Because if you look at um, what he's uh, talking about, um, then you see that this what, what seems to be like a categorization, once again, of different groups of people does not really work together because it's different, uh, it's different um, logics behind it. For example, Maronite, the term Maronite, denotes something quite clear. So the Maronites are uh, um, a community in Lebanon, a recognized community. It's actually the biggest Christian community in Lebanon. Um, maybe it's important to know that those have always been supported by the French, so the French back them a lot. Yes, but what can be a Maronite historian? Is it actually somebody who writes history for the Maronites or from the perspective of the Maronites? And what could it be to have a subdivision, a further subdivision, saying Maronite nationalists, Maronites and Maronite nationalists? Um, how can you grasp that? How can you think that subdivision? Actually, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to even to, to get there because Maronite nationalists um, points to the fact that they are nationalists somehow. And of course, there were many right-wing uh, Maronites at that time, as still today. But the problem is that here, this nationalism is sectarian. And that's based on the exclusion of other groups from national identity. So you have at the same time nationalists and Maronites. So this doesn't really work together. Um, the same is also true, but this is maybe not so apparent for people that are not uh, familiar with, with Lebanon, for socialists. Because if you hear socialists, maybe you think of certain political ideas, socialist ideas. In Lebanon, actually, there is a socialist party until today, which is called Progressive Socialist Party. But in Lebanon, this is another name for the party of the Druze, as this party constitutes its major political organ. This is so true that in Lebanon, socialist in Arabic, the word for socialist in Arabic, came to simply signify Druze in the language of everyday life. So if you are now a Lebanese, a Lebanese spectator of this uh, notebook, you see something completely different as if you were just, like we all, somebody who just does not know that and thinks, okay, these are just categories that exist and that are just all the same thing. Um, yeah, Marxist, then you have Marxist in the, in the row and Marxist, of course, this is, there were several Marxist um, uh, parties at that time. Uh, maybe it's important also to know that um, that most of them were multi-confessional. So here we are in a completely different uh, line than with the others. But of course, they were also militias and they were also fighting just as all the others. But the strangest category that he's bringing up here is maybe Islamists. Because what does that mean? What is Islamist? Who is an Islamist? Actually, the term is may mostly used in a pejorative way. Mostly, the most of the time, if you hear Islamists, it does not refer to a particular movement as such, but to uh, criticize 
Arabs. <laughs> normally, if you see it, for example, in, in the media, normally Islamists, it's, it's also said, it's mostly said to say these are terrorists, they are the bad guys. While you don't have so many people actually saying that they are Islamists. You have, of course, people that say they are Shia, they are believers or whatever, but Islamists is really a word that is mo much more used in the Western press. Um, yeah, so one could ask here, if this is actually the thing that Dr. Fahri did, what does he mean? Is it him actually, is it his own Christian bias operating here, saying that some of them are Islamists? For, are for Dr. Fahri, all these people, all Muslims, Shia, Sunni and the other de denominations alike, are they all Islamists? Does he want to, to judge them? Is it that? So what we see here actually is that all these classifications, we, immediately we, we classify, we, ac we have to accept them when they are written here, that they actually do not work. And we are immediately in speculation. We are actually in this situation that he reproduces much more through the form, the way how he, he, he notes all these things, than with the content. So what seems to be coherent um, contains, in fact, a multitude of subtly, subtle antagonisms revealing themselves through further examination of the historical context in which they occur. In this particular historical context, a strict distinction between religious communities and politics is just not operable. You cannot, you cannot grasp Lebanese history in that way. Mm. So if you think the Lebanese wars, and, or even the way how to write history uh, from a perspective from here, then f uh, you, have to, you cannot but completely distort the history as such, because there are different elements that play a role, elements that you just don't get if you are not um, there, if you don't take into account the experiences of the people, the way how words function, so the same words do not mean the same thing when you're here or when you're he there in Lebanon. And also, for example, this clear division between facts and rumors does not really work. And here you, one could also ask, what does it mean to have clear facts? When is a fact a fact? When is an event a fact? Is it who decides that it becomes a fact and how can you guarantee for that? What is a cold fact? Here, where you always have, you cannot think in Lebanon a fact without having um, uh, like the, the way how it is um, transmitted, how it is mediated. You cannot uh, dissociate the two. This is maybe something that Walid Rad is pointing here also. So in the Atlas group, you have really many different uh, kinds of references to the problem of knowledge transfer from one reality to another. In some of the files, this transpires directly through the incongruity of translations. Most of the documents, and you see it here, for example, ha have indeed different languages and um, mediate something through different languages. Sometimes the same reference is rendered in different languages, not here, but in others, in the one that we will see after. And then you will see that you don't know which one comes first, which is the translation and which one is the original, which is, by the way, a big question for Walidrat in general. What is a copy if you don't have an original? What does that mean? Because here you never have an original, it's always copies. Um, here, for example, you see that uh, if you are not Lebanese or if you are not familiar with the two or three languages, then you will never get the whole, uh, the whole document as such. You will never understand it fully. So the next document is this one. It's called Already Been in a Lake of Fire. And it's also attributed uh, to Dr. Fadel Fakhouri. And here you see what I just said even uh, visually. So this is the first and the last page. It depends on the direction in which you read. Here you see once again you have here uh, in Arabic the appendix. I'll tell you in a minute what it says. 
And here in, in English you have written, already been in a lake of fire. By the way, it's also written like in a really nice handwriting, which maybe might point to like a school child that is writing also, also this, uh, um, also this notebook looks like a, like a school notebook somehow. So, um, as the story goes, Dr. Fachori sought to photograph vehicles whose make, model, and color corresponded exactly to those that have been used as car bombs during the civil wars. Alluding to the fact that it was a common habit of journalists of that time to replace elaborate elucidations of the political motives and impact of such attacks, attacks by a symptomatic fetishization of the car itself, this file is once more concerned with the general climate of insecurity and paranoia and rumors and hearsay. So this is how it looks. These are uh, supposedly the exact models and makes and colors of the cars that have been used as car bombs. Um, yeah, by the way, there's another file also concerned with car bombs. Car bombs actually uh, played a great wall, uh, role in the Lebanese wars. Until today, you have constantly car bombs exploding somewhere in Beirut or somewhere else in, Be in Lebanon. In the other file, uh, uh, the other file actually contains only photographs of engines, the engines that have been expulsed and that are the only remaining part of the car <laughs> after. So there also you see that uh, the journalists were only concentrating on really minor details. Here, all of the cars that you see here have um, blackened license plates also. So I'll show you some others. Here, by the way, you even have a cat. <laughs> I don't know if you see that. Here. So you see it's real photo photographies, actually, of real cars that are, of course, not the cars that have exploded, because if not, he would, could not have photographed them. Um, none of these cars, of course, has been effectively used as a car bomb, but uh, all, of the, all of the cars could be used as a car bomb one day. Um, or still, yeah, maybe. And this somehow um, points to the fact that maybe the danger is a bit everywhere because these kinds of cars, of course, you find them everywhere in Beirut. Um, next to the cars, what you have, so uh, yeah, another, sorry, another important point is that um, if you look at these cars, you see actually the environment in the windows. So it's not only, as you have in advertising, for example, only a make and a model. No, he really chose to reproduce real cars, real cars that you find any, anywhere. So you have somehow Beirut or something else reflected in the windows here. OK, so next to the image, so what you have here or there, so this is the English translation and this is the Arabic text. Um, so the English uh, typewritten uh, list that you see here, for example, uh, enumerates allegedly factual details. So it says the make, the model, and the color of the car, the date and location of the incident, the number of victims, and the size of the crater left by the explosion, and specifications concerning the explosives that were used. So even if this data deflects completely the, de the attention from the event as such, because what is the event? Is the event these cold facts? Or is the event something completely different, something much more complex as a politically motivated act that has a history and that has to be understood historically? Here you only have cold facts. And those cold facts aren't even sure, because sometimes actually in the description, you have something like the make could be Toyota or Subaru, or the color is red or blue. So red or blue, that, that means you just don't know. <laughs> could also just don't put anything. But still, as you have this list and this information, this suggests first that it's somehow important, 
because it's a list, <laughs> and also a certain neutrality and objectivity. In contrast, the Arabic texts that you have here, you already see actually, it's, all, it's artfully integrated into uh, the design of the page, it's handwritten, so it's like a, and it's beautiful normally Arabic writing also. And it's also, if you look at the text, I, I imagine not many of you can read it, but um, actually the texts are completely differently structured. It's not a list that you can see, even if you don't read it. And instead of enumerating facts, it describes what happened. So uh, it adds sometimes further elements, like for example, the exact or approximate uh, location, which actually helps those people who know the neighborhoods, who know Beirut or other parts of Lebanon, to identify who was targeted because normally you know who lives where and then you can, you can deduct the, uh, certain things. Um, it also quotes its sources and reports the event in a much more dramatic way. So for example, it says the new carnage, or it says the series of horrors. So you see that this is not at all cold facts. Here you are with a mediation that tries to give you a sense of what happened, a specific sense, so it's not objective. It does not want to be objective also. So you have actually these two very different ways of reporting an event uh, in the same document. But you, if you don't know it, you don't see that it's two different ways that are here coming together. So while the English text follows a logic of tabularization, listing pre-specified supposedly relevant characteristics, the Arabic version links disparate information through narration constructs a more complex story and alludes to implicit local knowledge beyond the effective, effectively, effectively sorry, reported facts. Both avoid a thorough analysis of the situation. So none of them gives you any explanation of what happens. And both provide information without an actual, actual connection with a photographed car as such. This is also very important because here you are in front of photographs, you have a photograph, you have a caption, and you have a supposed link between both, but actually there is no real link between both. Rather, one could say that the images connected to the text are a kind of visual argument or something like that, or an illustration of what the words say. Because actually there is first the idea of what what some witnesses said, what this car ha could have been. This is what you have. This is the information starting from which you construct all the information that you have in the, in, the, in the document later. Even if, and that's important, the form alludes to a different device, which is very common in media and also in research documents actually, uh, which is the device that links an indexical image, a photograph or a film, uh, with a cap with a caption which grounds it in a specific context or meaning. So normally, if you have an image and a text accompanying it, you link them together. And normally, you, uh, you associate this with, with a reality. Say this image shows something, the text explains it to me. So here I have something like, this constructs you an event or a narrated event or fact. Here actually, and this is also explicit, as the appendix said. The appendix says that the only thing that you have is a copy of the cars, a, a supposed copy of the cars. You don't have anything sure in this document. It's all only construction. And he says that to you. But still you will believe that there is something about this. There's something about these cars. There, there must be something with that. Okay. And of course you also have uh, many other things that you could say about these cars because it's, it's also just beautiful how he put them together. Okay, I just come to a, if I still have some time, just wanted to, to talk about a last document. Document, I think I cannot show you the film today because I'm already um, I already talked too much, but you can all uh, see it actually in the internet. 
everything, all these documents are an, on the project's website, which is www.theatlasgroup.org. So if any of you wants to have a look. So the last one, what I want to talk to about is, um, is actually attributed to a character that is called Suhail Bashar. And this is interesting not only because actually um, this video has been done after Walid Raad's doctoral thesis. <laughs> actually, he was working on the subject of this film. Of course, his doctoral thesis was not this video, but all the, the topics that he touches in this video is in his uh, doctoral thesis. And maybe this is why this video is so dense and complex. It's really, I really uh, recommend you to watch it. And this character, Suhail Bashar, who just uh, took his thesis and <laughs> made a video out of it, is interesting because he actually clearly expresses his refusal of accurate translation, but not in the video because there's something different still, which is a fictive interview that Walid Raad did with Suhal Bashar, which is published in a book. And actually, in this um, fictive interview, Bashar says uh, or declares that he has himself translated the video from Arabic to English, just to add that he did not wish to comment on the fact that the English version is sometimes opposite sometimes completely unrelated to the Arabic original. So he says he, it's purposely, uh, he purposely didn't translate what is said in the English. Uh, the English translation purposely does not translate exactly the Arabic. So that's interesting. So this is just one image from the video. So the distortions here in that video are presented as deliberate decisions with an implicit critical tenor. They suggest that the relation between an object or an event and the word supposed to grasp it is not simply transferable without consideration of the historical situation. And I think that I already talked a lot about that, that if you don't know anything about Lebanon, you will not understand these uh, documents as or all the implications in the documents. And this is, of course, even, even more the case um, in a media landscape, which often describes events and actors in a simplified manner, ex abstracting from the field of meaningful res resonances in which they are embedded. This is, for example, the case uh, with the mediations of events in the Middle East by the American press. And this you all know that if you look what happens in the Middle East here, normally you have the bad guys <laughs> clearly named. Uh, so if you name somebody as Arab or Muslim, it's often pejorative in Europe as well, actually, and that's kind of a problem. And this is what especially the Bashar tapes are uh, concerned with. So Suhail Bashar, is described as a low-level employee of the Kuwaiti embassy in Beirut. And actually he's played, it's him, uh, on the right. All the others, and here you have the actual images of the real uh, hostages. All, all the other five men were real hostages during, uh, in the 80s in Lebanon. And uh, I'll talk more about them later. Um, what is important for, for the uh, Suel Bashar which is the fictive figure. He's actually played by a very famous Lebanese actor, but this is something that, of course, people that are not in Lebanon don't know. So for Lebanese, it's clear immediately that this is a fiction. For others, once again, it's like with the Dr. Fakhoury. You have an image, and it's difficult to not to believe that it's true, that it exists, he exists. So Basha is said, having been abducted by Islamist terrorists, and held captive in the same room as those five American hostages that you see here. The names he mentions, so these five uh, other hostages here, are Terry Anderson, uh, Thomas Sutherland, Benjamin Weir, Martin Jenko, and David Jacobson. And all of them actually really existed, really have been abducted, and um, all of them also have written memoirs. That's important, so the books exist. Also. 
So their individual cases and those of other Western hostages have, of course, often made the headline news. And if you look at now also the news, if you have ho hostage cases, normally those that you know normally are Americans, French, Germans. Normally you don't have uh, Arabic hostages in the media represented, which is, by the way, also true for the Lebanese press. So even in the Lebanese press, you have a lot of uh, you have the American, French, German hostages, but you don't have all the Lebanese that have been abducted. And there were really, I don't know how many thousands that are even still missing today, and nobody talks about them, even in Lebanon. So that's also important. So here, if you have here Suel Bashar, it's not only that he responds directly to that as an Arab hostage in the same cell as the American hostages, um, but it's also, actually, he also does something different still in that video. So the video that I won't show you now, but that you can watch on the website, <laughs> is um, composed as an intricate montage of different visual and audio materials. So you have, for example, different kinds of images that are edited together. You have low-quality rushes focusing frontally on Bashar. This year, I don't have images of that here while he's speaking, and you have some archival material. As here you see in the background, uh, you have Ronald Reagan. Uh, no, sorry, you have Bush. No, Reagan. It's Reagan. Yeah, it's Reagan, sorry. Yeah, you have Reagan. Of course you have Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you have Reagan, of course. Uh, yeah, you have other historical uh, uh, rushes from, from the television news in the film. Um, you also have different soundtracks that overlap. So you have, for example, Basha's monologue in Arabic. He speaks in Arabic. You have its simultaneous translation into English, spoken by, as he says, a neutral female voice. And you have another uh, voiceover, a male voiceover, reporting general information and other noises as well, of course. So the video appears as an overloaded constellation with um, correlates the divergent images and sounds without hierarchy. So they are all there somehow. And <coughs> but still you have um, the personal account of Suel Bashar that serves as a frame because it's him who explains what happens. It's him who makes an analysis. It's him who criticizes also what you can see. Um, he introduces the subject and he clarifies details about his shared captivity with the American hostages. However, he does not so much uh, speak about the way he experienced the captivity. What he does instead is he talks about uh, his conditions a bit and um, on his co-detainees. He talks about the Americans, actually. Um, he says that these Americans had taken an ambiguous stance towards him. So he's really talking about himself in this community of the hostages. And he says, despite the fact that they were all forced to share the same conditions as hostages, so they were in the same situation, the Americans would gang up on him as he shared the same origins uh, with the perpetrators. So he was in that situation that he was at the same time a victim as the others and the bad guy because he was an Arab. So he was neither with the, um, with the uh, perpetrators nor with the, the other hostages somehow. Not only, he says, did the Americans exclude him from the community of victims, but they were also visibly both attracted and repulsed by his presence. He says, actually, he's, he goes quite into detail in the video. He's talking about their sexual fantasies on him. He even speaks about the fact that he also got attracted, but then they wouldn't, that wouldn't go fur any further, which, um, yeah, which echoes a bit with, <coughs> sorry, Edward Said's book on Orientalism, actually, where, uh, I don't know if, if you read the book, but um, where it's quite um, uh, present that actually the, Europeans uh, projected all kinds of sexual fantasy or sexual characteristics on the Arabs they met. 
here also here it's the American hostages that tried to approach uh, Suel Bashar but then uh, were repulsed at the same time. But rather than denouncing this behavior, Bashar questions this attitude by associating it to the way the Americans dealt with the situation at the time already, but also afterwards. So instead of relating the abduction to the political context and the historical situation, instead of seeking to understand why it happened, why they were abducted, or why Americans were abducted in this context, and instead of reflecting on their own albeit, of course, in voluntary position, the Americans would perceive their kidnapping as something fateful, extraordinary, and tragic. She says, this evaluation is echoed by the fact that all the books they wrote, those memoirs that really exist, start actually with the weather, <laughs> with the weather conditions at the moment of their abduction. It was less, just like a thunderstorm, they considered their abduction as fatalistic coincidence and themselves as its accidental victims. Um, <clears throat> so what happens in these books actually is that they dissociate completely the subjective sphere from the complex reality in which it is embedded. It is only, these memoirs are only about the personal, individual experiences uh, of capture and dissociate this completely from the political sphere. Um, Basha's film, what, what, what the film does is it confronts these very subjective uh, reports on, on the experiences of, of capture. I, so Basha's film confronts them, among other things, with its opposite, with the television news that present themselves as cold facts as only reporting of facts. With the allegedly sober voice, mo um, male voice over, which appears as completely impersonal, actually. It says there's on the one hand, you have the purely subjective in the memoirs, and on the other hand, you have the purely objective with the, these images, with only cold facts, and you don't have any mediation between the two. You have either the one or the other. You don't have something that connects both. Um, it's a bit like in, in the other um, document that I just showed you. It's just like the English list in Already Been in the Lake of Fire. These news actually in, in the Basha tapes appear as neutral reports with a hegemonic claim to truth. They say as we are objective, it is true. It's only news, as if news were nothing mediated, as if this was only um, reality as it is. Basha's video, in contrast, inter interrelates subjective and objective elements in heterogeneous ways all the time. It breaks the appearance of uh, objectivity of the reported facts through the multiplication of divergent angles, for instance, by multiplying the sources and doubling, doubling the voiceovers, and by alterna alternate alternating, sorry, from the television image to his own or to a visual reconstruction like this one. As a first-hand witness of the facts, his confrontation reveals the partiality of the information divulged <coughs> through the news, because he is there as somebody who is not present in the news, somebody who would tell the story differently, so the news cannot be as objective as that. So the important thing is that what Bashar does, he is trying to, to mediate one to the other and to, to open, to question, actually, to say it cannot be only true. It's only one person questioning these things in a specific way. And I think to end with, with I would just like to relate this to something that uh, an author that you all know very well <laughs> has said about the objective and the subjective, as we were talking about this now. Uh, Adorno uh, writes in Minima Moralia, the notions of subjective and objective have been completely reversed. Objective means the non-controversial aspect of things, the unquestioned impression, the facade made up uh, of classified data, that is, the subjective. And they call subjective anything which breaches the facade 
engages the specific experience of a matter, casts off all ready-made judgments and substitutes relatedness to the object for the majority consensus of those who do not even look at it, let alone think about it, that is, the objective. So I think maybe starting from these things, we can just discuss this further. Thank you. Hi, so I have two relatively simple questions. Uh, when was the website put up and has it been updated since it was put up? And are the two digits next to each of the notebooks signifying like the date they were found or is it something Which different? Which ones? Uh, hold on, so I wanted to say to you one sec. Uh, Bakuri had three notebooks and they all have different digits next to them. So like, for example, the first one says 38. Yeah, oh, it's the volume number. Yeah, it's the volume number actually. Okay, well then, so I guess I only have one question, which is yeah, okay. when was the website put up and has it been updated since it was put up? Actually, I'm, I don't think it w has been updated ever since. <laughs> I don't know, uh, but uh. I, it still looks the same to me. So I've seen it the first time, I don't know, somehow in 2005, and it, for me it looked like that. Okay. Um, so when I think of an archive, I kind of immediately, yeah, think of it as like a set thing. Mm -hmm. And then I'm led to wonder how uh, people interact with it or use it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question is, have there been any significant interactions um, with the group, I guess? And has the artist taken this into consideration? Like, because you... Um, said a few times how someone who wouldn't be familiar with the history of mm -hmm. Lebanon would you know, be totally thrown through a loop with a lot of the material. So I'm just wondering if there have been these sort of interactions with the archive. Actually, the archive as such does not exist. It's really only virtual. It's, there is no real physical place where you could see these documents. You can only see it in exhibitions or on the website. So I don't think there have been uh, any real interactions as the material doesn't exist. Of course, there are people like you now or me um, questioning these documents. Um, yeah, but what is maybe also important is that uh, Walid Rad has been working in a lot of archives. So there are, as you saw, there are some, um, some images coming from the archives that then enter into his documents. Um, this is what, what he does. Maybe for him, it would, he would just say that, yeah, you have to do something with the information that you find. But uh, yeah, I, I cannot really answer as the, I, I think the important thing is that the archive doesn't really exist. It's really an idea more than something else. Besides the fact that there's, I see a schism between the video that you talked about at the end in terms of the unreliable narr narrator, because Bashar starts to seem as if in referencing Said, he's actually saying things that were true and important to understand. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I also wonder if um, Walid Rod had his, any thoughts about this in light of the Trump administration, because that's certainly mm. thrown a different, I mean, we used to think, especially looking at that image of Reagan, who is so mm. fantastically sincere in his appearance, mm -hmm. um, but, now we've all we all know not to trust anything. Yeah. Right. It's an interesting question. I don't know what Walid says about Trump, but I'm sure that he would even say this is in a line. Actually, maybe now it becomes really visible that uh, such a thing as alternative facts, even the concept, exists. I think, for example, in Lebanon, this is clear that there are only alternative facts and no. So it's a complete different situation because if, from the beginning you don't, you're always suspicious of what you see and you don't have anything really to trust. You, uh, I think you, you live with information differently and with facts and you, you think it differently. I don't know, now here Trump is, yeah, it's... They don't have retaliation if they find out things, like knowing mm. that your neighbor that you're working for was a warlord, yeah. it doesn't mean anything because everybody's decided to ignore the facts and get on with their you lives. You even have to, in Lebanon, you even have to because right. you have the amnesty law, actually. It's, right. it's very strange because there you really see a, um, a country that lives with these things that is not at all uh, surprised <laughs> by the way how, 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 for example, Trump now, for, for them it's like, okay, yeah, they, 
people have to learn to, to live with this kind of, of argumentation, you know, it's like, a, yeah, but in, in Lebanon, this is really very common, you know things, and you always have, if you have a fact, for example, I, I just tell you one situation, I've been living in Beirut, and there was a, the situation uh, when a, a big bomb exploded on a famous square in the middle of a Christian neighborhood, which was actually quite close to our house. And we then learned quite quickly that uh, the targeted man was, I think, the head of, uh, of, um, of the uh, secret services. And then immediately, and you, you knew it even before you saw the newspaper, you had, I don't know how many different versions of why this happened and who did it. You have always the version, of course, you have always the version Israel. <laughs> then uh, you have the version uh, at that time, you had the version because this guy that was targeted and that died also just arrested another man, and this other man actually was a was a Christian who worked with Assad uh, in in Syria, and who wanted to place a bomb in a Christian neighborhood so everybody would think it was Muslims that did it. So you see, it's it's like really complicated. You cannot, right. you have this kind. Of, after all, you can also think: was it Hezbollah? Was it? There are so many different um, different possibilities, and it's so difficult to find out because you always have this two times logic. You don't you don't just have like a uh, yeah uh, somebody wants to kill somebody, but sometimes some somebody kills somebody, so somebody else will think it was still another person. So so this makes things really complicated. A lot of plot. Yeah. <laughs> well, if Definitely. I may, then just the last comment. I, one of the things that the archive, I think, promises us is the archive promises closure. Mm -hmm. So even if an archive doesn't yeah. have all the documents, the idea and the ideal of the archive is there can be at some point a final accounting of things. Yeah. If we did actually collect enough or all of the documents, we would know this. But what this Wally Rod's project brings me to conclude is there may be some events, like what's been going on in Lebanon since 1975, and further, it may be that the nature of human affairs in general is we actually won't ever have a full accounting of what happened or the meanings of what happened. Mm -hmm. Alex wants to say something. Um, You mentioned that he had, uh, whichever uh, his audience is, he has different facts that he'll tell them, like uh, what time a certain event happened. Mm -hmm. um, this being online, it seems like the audience that he has in mind, like immediately has access to information to do their own research. Like uh, as they're on the website, they could. Uh, Actually, the website is one version. You have, if you see, I don't know which version was shown no, in I the mean, moment. No, I mean, like, uh, for example, like while you're in the website, you could easily go to Google and like research this information. So I, I think, like, in him having it only online, he at least has uh, the idea that the audience could always look it up. But mm. um, for the the people in Lebanon, like, how is the internet accessible to them? Readily? Yeah, yeah, fully. It's it's slow. <laughs> Internet, but it's fully accessible. There's no problem. No, yeah. actually, that this is not a problem in Lebanon. You can get information. The problem is you never know which information you can trust in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, but I think we all have the same problem because, you, of course, you can Google things, but which information can you trust? So I think this is more the point that that uh, Walidrat tries to to make up. That's in, in Lebanon in general. Uh, there's not, of course, there's cens censorship, but not in in the news. And in cinema, you have it sometimes, like with sex scenes uh, censured, for example. But, but um, yeah, this kind of news, the problem is that you have too many. You don't know what to do. You don't have the official version. That's the big thing, that here or in Europe or in an archive, and this is, I think, what, what Tom just said, this idea that you could find a place for any information. Here, actually, what Walid does, he says the system, the, the, the very idea of a system does not work. Ev does not work everywhere, and then you cannot think of a of a really a system that w could work anywhere because there's already this place where it doesn't work. Well, that, it's interesting that you mentioned Google because Google is not an alternative to the archive. Mm -hmm. Google, 
the premise of Google is this is the final. This is the all-inclusive archive. This is the archive hmm. to beat all archives. So it's not as if we're going to compare hmm. one or contest one with the other. Yeah. But anyway, we could go on and on, but this is just evidence of how much you've stimulated us this evening. So thank you very much, Stephanie Baumann. Thank you.